Hi guys, welcome to our final uh, video on uh, flat construction. Uh, and today we're going to look at pans and knits. So let's get into it. I'm going to start off with just a basic shape for our pants, and then we're going to fill in the sort of necessary construction, talking about it. Um, and I'm going to base this on our standard jean construction. Uh, so, which, by the way, has not changed much in over 100 years. So let's get a basic shape in there. Okay. One leg's a little bit longer and wider than the other. Let's just fix that. I guess it doesn't really matter, but... Okay. So here's our basic pant shape. And the first thing I want to add in is the center front seam. Now this is uh, the same on front and back. And it is what allows the pants to sort of um, split, to bifurcate into two separate parts. So you are always, always, always going to have a center front seam as well as a center back seam. Otherwise, the pants can't split. Um, and it's often forgot, so I like to start there. And we're typically going to see it on almost every uh, type of pant, from dress pant. Um, and this also goes for knits as well. So if you're making sweatpants or leggings, they are also going to have that center front seam. Um, so always remember to put it in. Okay? So let's assume this is going to be the front of the pants. Um, as I said, that was our center front seam. So what else typically goes on our um, typical pair of jeans? Well, we have pockets. Now, pant pockets, jean pockets, will typically come from the waist to about the high hip and kind of curve like this. Um, this will also come in addition with top stitching to finish those edges. Now, you can have lots of different types of pockets for pants. So just to show you some other sort of pant pocket shapes, and again, there's a lot on that handout that I talked about in the previous episodes. Um, dress pants, the pocket will typically be a straight line from the waist down to like the high hip area, like this, but of course it will also have the top stitching. Uh, you can also make it angular, so you can have an, like an angled shape pocket. Really, you can do anything that you want. Um, again, this is up to you. So if you want to do a fun shape for your pocket, or whatever you want, uh, that's perfectly fine. Again, a little bit harder to sew, but this is a style um, sort of line. So as long as you want it to be a functioning pocket and it is big enough for your hand to fit through, you can really do that line, whatever shape or you know line that you want. Okay. So now that we got our pockets, we might also have a little change pocket or a watch pocket or whatever you want to uh, call it. It's typically on the right side, although you can put it on both or whatever side that you want. Um, this is a, a little bit of a patch pocket that's set in the middle there, so you want to put a little bit of top stitching on that too. Now I'm also going to mention that on most jeans, and uh, especially most non-cheap jeans, the pockets will have rivets at the corners. This is one of the inventions that made jeans so popular. It's a reinforcement on those pockets. Now, jeans have a long history as a, a work clothes, um, so they're made to be very, very durable, very, very tough. Uh, so those rivets um, give extra reinforcement to the corners of the pockets uh, where the most amount of stress occurs. Um, you can put them there, as most jeans still do have them, although most jeans now are just sort of leisure wear and have no relevance uh, to work. Well, but sometimes they are still used in work. So if you want your jeans to be nice and tough, uh, you have a little bit of extra money to put those nice uh, reinforcements on there, I'd add a few studs at the corner pockets. They're very uh, often seen. Now what else are we missing? Well, of course, we're missing the waistband. All pants are typically going to be finished with a waistband. Um, however, if you are making dress pants 
and you want a clean finish on the top, uh, the same rule applies as skirts. Now, skirts are often uh, finished with waistbands as well, but if you're making a dress pant, uh, you can finish it with a facing on top as well. Um, so, just like with the skirts, if you wanted to finish it with a facing, just go ahead and put your top stitching right across just like that. Okay? So, um, what else are we missing? Well, we're missing the indication of a fly. Now, on most pants, and jeans especially, uh, our closure is the fly. And the same rules apply for our closure as they do for the skirts. They must come from the waist and go down to about uh, the full hip, uh, at least. Um, and so, our, again, our jeans are no different. So we're going to have to put in our zipper closure, which um, in this case is going to sit in a fly. Uh, now we're not going to draw the zipper in because, again, it's sort of hidden in the fly, as uh, you would know from a normal pair of jeans. You don't see the zipper, but what you do see is the top stitching to finish that fly right there. So we indicate the fly with that um, top stitching. Um, and it's letting us know that the zipper starts from here and goes down here. Now to complete our closure, we need to allow the waistband to open, which means that this center front line is going to come up straight through the waistband, and that's where it overlaps. Now in addition to this, we typically see a button right here that will help us uh, to close the pants. And um, you can do this a number of ways if you don't want the button showing. Uh, you can put a little sort of uh, snap on the inside or a hook on the inside. Um, it's up to you. Just mm -hmm. indicate um, whatever you're adding in, uh, either in a note um, or you can <clears throat> do a little sort of, you know, close-up drawing. You can take a section of it and say, okay, well, this is this. And then you can flip down the side. So if it's like a hook on the inside, you can show the little hook here on the inside of the pants, just like so. Um, okay. Now there's also, um, it's not as popular anymore, but there are button flies, um, which don't show on the inside. So if you do want to do a button fly or something like that, again, I would do a similar little drawing like that to show the inside, um, or just make a note of it. Now last to finish up the front, we gotta go ahead and add a little bit of top stitch to the hem, of course. Um, just like anything else, that's a finished edge, just like the hem of our skirts or the ed, uh, cuffs of our sleeve. They need that top stitching to finish it off. Okay, so there's the front of our pants. Now let's take a look at the back. Now the back is, um, a lot of it has already been determined by what we have done on the front. So of course, we're just going to see that waistband on the back as well. And we're also going to see that center back line, that center line um, in the back. Now, um, as you remember from our skirt, we have a bit of fitting issue here. In typically jeans or a lot of pants are very, very fitted. Uh, at least up here around the butt. Um, so what we need to do is we need to add, you guessed it, darts or seams to create that fit. Again, we are working with wovens and jeans, of course, are usually made out of denim, which is a twill, uh, which is in the wovens family. Um, any stretch that we see in denim today is uh, because a little bit of spandex has been added to the cotton fiber to make the denim. Um, and again, it's not quite enough to just sort of stretch around your body like leggings or something like that. Um, it's just there to give it a little bit more comfort, um, a little bit more ease, and especially when, you know, skinny jeans were very, very um, stylish. Uh, it allows that really sort of body-hugging shape that those skinny jeans, um, you know, created. So on the back of jeans, we typically see uh, a yoke, um, and this is a little bit different than the shirt yoke. Um, but it serves the same purpose, and it serves the purpose here of fitting around the butt, so creating that shape, being able to hug the body. 
Um, otherwise, it would be quite flat and very difficult to fit into. So our standard yoke construction basically goes from just a little bit below the waist, kind of angling downward like this. And you probably have seen that before. Um, now, your yoke seam uh, is sort of like your yoke seam in the shirt, where it's a style line, and so long as you are going through, so if you remember our uh, rule of thumb when it came to fitting around the back, uh, it has to go through those full points of the butt to be able to create the fit needed. Um, and so long as we are doing that, we can kind of go and be creative with our yoke seams. Um, again, that's just the standard yoke seam that we'll, we would see on jeans. But if you wanted to, you know, I don't know, um, do something a little bit more pointed, I guess, do the sort of Western shirt style yoke seam here, you can do that. It's up to you. Um, you just have to pass through those points and really make it whatever you want. But do be careful because, again, it's a line going across the butt, so whatever we do, we want to make it um, as flattering as possible. So that kind of goes with the pointed down. It's a rather attractive line to have in that area. So let's put back our standard seam. Oh my gosh, I forgot something on the front. I'm going to have to go. I'll go back. Um, I forgot the belt loops. Um, I'll go back and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so that's our fit, which is, you know, one of the most important construction aspects of our pants. Now you might say, oh, but um, can't I do darts on the back? You can do darts on the back. It's very atypical for jeans. I don't know if I've ever seen a pair of jeans with darts on the back. And it's typically more common in um, uh, uh, female dress pants than it is in male pants of any kind. Uh, typically men are always going to have that sort of yoke seam, even in dress pants. Um, or a pleat or something uh, to fit, uh, but you will see uh, darts in the back of pants for women, um, and that's perfectly fine. You can do your fitting there if you'd like to do darts instead of a yoke, perfectly fine. Now a couple of the things we got on the back, we got those lovely patch pockets that we're used to seeing, and I went over patch pockets a little bit on the shirt, so um, I'm not going to go too far into it, but remember it's a shape. Any, a patch pocket can be any shape that you want and be placed anywhere you want. Usually it's placed a little bit over the oak seam. And of course, it has those little top stitching to um, be able to attach it on. Sometimes um, designers will go uh, and do a little bit of a, a, a top stitch design. Maybe loop is kind of common or even uh, designer initials in top stitch on the back pockets. Whatever you want to do, it's up to you. And again, the shape of those pockets, those are the standard shape, but you can make it any shape that you want. So if you want to make them, um, you know, little hearts, you can make them little hearts. You want to make them, um, you know, a kind of rounded bottom, you can do that. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> it is just a separate piece of fabric that is stitched on to create the pocket. So it does not affect the fit or the construction uh, no matter what shape or placement of your patch pockets. Um, however, uh, like I said before, you do kind of want to place your pockets in a way that they will be flattering to the uh, backside. So if we can imagine, um, and I've seen some pretty funny um, sort of internet guides to pocket placement in your butt, so if we have sort of a butt like this, we want our pockets to kind of sit so the points go kind of down to the curve. That's the most flattering placement for them. If you do it too high or too low, it starts to affect the sort of um, uh, optical impact. Um, it can make the look, butt look kind of flat or it can make it look kind of saggy. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind um, when you're placing your pockets. Um, and, you know, people want to wear things that are flattering to them. So, you know, that pocket placement is going to be important. Okay. Um, in addition, I want to put some belt loops on. Now, belt loops can really go anywhere, but of course, almost like everything else, they have a standard place. And this one I'm going to go back and do the front, too. So there's typically three on the back, 
one right in the center back, and two more that are placed just in from the side seam. So something just like that, okay? Now on the front, since I forgot, uh, the front pockets tend to align, or sorry, the front belt loops tend to align with the front pocket. So if I have the front over here, there's the waistband, and we have this and this. Let's put our pockets in. Um, the belt loops on the front are going to kind of align with where the um, front pockets meet the waist. Okay, again, you can put them anywhere. This is just the sort of standard construction for it. Okay, um, that kind of wraps up pants. Um, there's, you know, not really too much more I want to say about them. Um, remember your yokes, remember your center front, center back seams. Um, and in addition, uh, actually there is one more thing. Um, so remember when we talked about sleeves and if they're quite narrow, you might need some extra construction details to be able to get the hands through. Well, the same for pants. So imagine we have a very narrow pant leg. Um, if you noticed, our feet are quite a bit larger than our ankles. So this is very small. This is kind of a large area. So if you want a pant cuff that really hugs the anchor, ankle and is very, very close, very, very tapered, um, you might have an issue with getting your foot through the pant leg. Um, and this can be solved a couple of different ways, and, and really the same ways as we solved this problem with the um, uh, shirt cuff. We can bend it, put a little bent in there, just like so. We can put a little zipper if you don't want to um, have anything sort of flared out. The, the vent will flare out the silhouette a little bit. So if you don't want that, we can put a little zipper in. Just like so. So you can zip it open and then zip it shut uh, once your foot is through. You can even put a little vent with buttons on it. This is kind of very common, little buttons. A little button placket that goes up along the seam that you can unbutton. Put your pant foot, uh, foot through the cuff and then button it back up. So just uh, take that into consideration, especially when you're doing any sort of woven that is uh, very closely fitting to the ankle or to the wrist. Um, again, we always want to be able to get in and out of our garments. Um, pretty important. Okay. So let's move on to knits. Now, knits, as I was saying in the very beginning, um, have a different sort of set of rules for their construction. And this is because knits have uh, inherent stretch in their material. Um, and that stretch makes it easier to put the garments on and off. Um, and it also makes it easier to shape around the body. So um, given this, we do not typically need the closures uh, that we need in wovens. And we do not typically need the darts and the seams that we have in wovens. So um, let's take a look at some sort of standard knit garments, maybe like a shirt and um, just pants, and see how they're a little bit different. Now, um, overall, I would say the construction for knits is very much easier, but there are certain things that are unique to knit construction that you have to consider. So let's take a shirt, maybe just like a long sleeve t-shirt. I'm going to do the shape and then add in the details that we need. So uh, first things first, same as wovens, we need armhole seams. Um, there's nothing magical about knits that make it that we don't need armhole seams, although the same exceptions to the rule apply. Uh, if you have a big sort of saggy dolman sleeve that has a lot of sort of baggy, uh, you know, kind of goes a little bit more like this, has that extra excess under the armpit, um, you don't need it. You can do that. That's the same here in, in knits as it was in wovens. Um, now, the other thing is we need something to finish the edges of uh, the garment. Now, um, take a look at some sweaters that you have, some t-shirts that you have. Um, they will all typically be trimmed with some kind of ribbed 
knit. And sometimes this is stitched on. It's a separate piece, a separate trimming that is stitched on. And sometimes it's just knit in. So we have the possibility when we knit to knit a rib um, and then go to just another style of knit. We can switch our knit styles uh, midway through. Um, so I want to just put in our rib stitch and I want to then show you just an example. A couple examples of this rib. So I, I showed you an example because I was wearing a very appropriate sweater the first day when I was talking about the difference between uh, knits and wovens. But let me just go grab something real quick. I think, I think I have, here we go. Now this is an example, let's see if you can get real close, um, of a uh, rib trim that would be used maybe um, on the bottom of a sweatshirt or the cuffs of a sweatshirt. And as you can see, it's a separate piece. It kind of, um, it folds over, at least I think it does. Oh, never mind, I, I would fold it over, but this one doesn't. I thought it did. And I just can't pull it apart. No, okay, anyways. Um, but if you look real close, you can see, hopefully we can see this if it's coming through. I don't know, can let me stretch it and you can see. So um, it, it sort of has a little bit of this sort of vertical lines. And remember uh, the, that ribbing is switching from the knit to the um, purl stitch. And it's very strong and it's very stretchy. And that's why we place it on the edges of our knit garments. It helps protect, protect the overall shape um, of the knit garment. Because if you can imagine, since there's no extra um, closures, you know, this has to stretch over our head. It has to stretch over, you know, our shoulders or our bust. Uh, or it has to stretch over our hands. So it's doing a lot of stretching and pulling back. And to give it a little bit more durability and resiliency, uh, the knit trim, I'm sorry, the rib trim, um, is very important for that. Um, if it doesn't have it there, if it's just a, a plain knit all the way down, uh, it'll tend to stretch out and lose its shape a little bit more quickly. You can see I'm wearing a, um, a t-shirt um, and it has that rib trim on the collar here. So if you can see, you see the rib trim? It's, it's stitched on, it's not, and typically the neckline will be stitched on because um, it's a little bit harder to do that way, but it has that nice little rib trim on the neck there, again, to help preserve that neck neckline shape. Um, so there we are. So remember, all the edges of our knits um, are typically trimmed with some type of rib. Um, and again, it can be stitched on as a separate piece, or it can be, uh, knit in. So if I was knit in, I would just take away that seam and just keep the indication of the rib knit there. Okay? Um, important to remember. Uh, and again, even if this is tight, it doesn't need a closure. Let's take a look at maybe some sweatpants. Now sweatpants will typically be finished with a waistband and uh, uh, have a sort of drawstring in it. And again, this will allow us to kind of pull it tight and so it won't fall off. So I'm gonna put a little bit of a drawstring right in there. Now, when you pull a drawstring in, you can do drawstrings with knits or wovens, um, but when you pull in a drawstring, a few things are gonna happen. Uh, it's going to bunch up your waistband so you're gonna get this kind of bunching in your waistband, because if you imagine the waistband is large, uh, uh, rather large, but when you squish in with the uh, drawstring, it gets smaller and it kind of creates the shirring effect. So I'm gonna put that in and that will carry on into the actual garment as well. So it will kind of come in and create a little bit of bunching here as well. Now, depending on how much you, you know, you, a lot of normal sort of sweatpants, just a little extra cinch so you're not going to get a whole ton of that um, 
uh, shirring, so it really just depends on how wide you make it. Maybe make it a little soft. And then we have, of course, our center front seam, which we need in our uh, knits as well. We can't get away from that. But let's switch to the back, and the back would look pretty much the same, just we don't have the opening for the uh, uh, drawstring there. I don't need any extra darts or yokes or anything like that. We just need this. The last thing is we probably will have it uh, trimmed with, you don't have to have it pucker in like this, um, uh, a one by one rib trim like this. So it might be trimmed with something that looks very much like this. Uh, if it's not quite as big, it's sort of more of like an 80s style sweatpant, you might just get, you know, something that's not pinched in, but has maybe a little bit of a smaller little rib like that. Okay. So, um, knits, of course, a little bit um, easier to indicate. The last thing I want to indicate with knits, too, before I sort of wrap up, um, is there are lots of different knit stitches, and if you have a particular placement of a knit, like say you want to do a cable knit sweater, you're going to have to indicate that somehow on your flat. So say I'm doing like a, um, this is a sweater vest. I have my little trim down here and I want a cable knit to come down the center. Of course I have my trim that I would need. And again, I'm indicating where that cable knit is going to be. So if you have area specific knit designs, Always indicate those on your flats because uh, the uh, uh, placement of them is really important. Okay, now um, I want to just go over uh, a couple things about drawing flats that is kind of catch-all and not specific to any one type of garment. Um, and this is actually a really good place to start because um, as you can see here, I have a v-neck, so part of the back is showing. Now, if any part of the back or front, depending on what view you're working on, it can be seen, uh, say, between a uh, behind a, a, a neckline or part of the skirt or whatever else, you have to draw the whole thing. It's very confusing if you don't. Um, and then further, you have to shade the part that's back because, again, it can be very difficult to understand what's part of the front and what's part of the back if you don't shade it. So let me show you just another example of this. Say I have a skirt that is a high-low skirt. So it's hot, the hem is higher in the front than it is the back. So let's say we have it kind of, woo -woo, kind of coming down here like this. And then, you know, we have it kind of coming down here like this. And we'll try to make it as symmetrical as possible. So something that kind of looks like this. I'm just going to get this a little bit wider. Okay, so I have this instance where this is the front of my skirt and the hem is really high and this is the back of the skirt, okay? So one, I have to draw the back of the skirt because I can see it, right? Because this goes up far enough for me to be able to see it. I don't want to not have the back um, shown. Um, but in addition, I have to go ahead and shade it. Now I'm on this whiteboard shading it by using these sort of crosshatch lines. However, I do not recommend using crosshatch shading on your flats. Um, I would just use, fill it in with a gray and um, if you're doing it by hand, which, you know, um, you're doing it for practice, so you can use a gray marker. But if you're doing an illustrator, which of course you have to do for this class, um, you can fill it in with a shape, uh, set the opacity to that shape down, uh, and fill it with gray. So it'll look, give it a nice little shadow. Now I have an additional video on, you know, just a review for flats, uh, but I might come out with another one. Uh, just to show a little bit more of the techniques, uh, a little more advanced techniques when it comes to flats, you know, doing shading and things like that. Um, but just know that any part that shows through from back to front or front to back uh, must be drawn and shaded to 
um, make it distinct from the front or back. So you can tell easily, because this is shaded, this is the back. Um, it's the back showing through to the front, and the part that is not shaded, of course, is the front. Same thing here. Okay, in addition, so most flats are done in black and white with no color fill or no, nothing else. Um, however, there are some exceptions. Um, one, if you have multiple fabrics, so let's take, um, uh, let's take another knit shirt, one of those, uh, if you've seen sort of like a, of course we're going to shade that, um, a baseball style shirt. Oh, this is actually, this is a bit of construction that I forgot to talk about in knits that might be, um, useful. Um, so let's, let's do it. So, um, these are often called baseball style shirts. Um, but this type of construction is seen uh, a lot of times in knits, and it is what is called a raglan seam, um, and it is an alternative to your armhole seam. Now, you can do raglan seams with wovens, just don't tend to see it that much. It's a little bit difficult. It's more difficult to fit around the shoulder when you do it in wovens. Um, it's not impossible, it's just rare. Um, I tend to see it in wovens on jackets where it's just kind of bigger and bulkier and you don't need that kind of close fit to begin with. So let's get our shape and let me show you how the raglan seam works. So like I said, it takes the place of our armhole seam. Can go down a little bit more. And so instead of kind of from the armpit to a low point shoulder, we're going to go armpit to neckline. And a lot of times these are contrasting fabrics, which was what I was going to try to talk about now. So let's say that the sleeves are contrasting fabric. I need to go ahead and show that. Now in this instance, it is okay to use color to show that this is going to be a contrasting color. Um, so you can sort of fill it in with a different color. Or you can fill it in, since a lot of times we do uh, many different types of colors, you can um, fill it in with a, uh, a gray. Just make sure the grays you're using for your shadows and the grays you're using, or black even, um, uh, for your contrasting fabric are different. So the grays, if you're going to use a gray for the contrasting fabric, use a different gray for your shadow just so you can tell the difference between the two. Okay? Um, so that will tell us, so the important reason to do that is if we have contrasting fabrics, again, these are guides to how it is made. So um, this allows us to know where the um, contrasting fabrics are going to be. So let's do a little t-shirt type deal here, and we can talk about uh, different sort of embellishments and how they look on flats. So um, any sort of like embellishment or anything else, uh, you're going to put, so say this, uh, you know, it has, maybe it has studs on the cuffs. You're going to put in your studs. So all those little things. Uh, the only exception to that is if it's all over. So imagine I have a shirt like this, and it has beads or sequins all over it. There's no difference um, in their placement. The whole thing is just evenly beaded, evenly sequined. I don't need to include that on, on the um, uh, flat because uh, when it is cut, I don't need to consider the placement of the sequins uh, because it's just all over. Uh, same thing with beads or prints or um, you know anything like that. The only time I need to indicate is when the placement of the beading or the sequins or the hardware or the print is placement specific. So let's go over a few examples of that so we know what that means. First, let's take a print. Let's imagine this shirt is made out of a print and it is, let's say, something like this. Okay, maybe it's this paisley print. Now this is an all over print and um, I don't really care where it's placed on the body, just as long as it has the print um, on it. Then I do not need to include any part of the print on the shirt because I'm just going to cut the printed fabric and the placement of the print on the garment doesn't matter. 
But let's say I have a, um, a print where it has a sort of bottom border that kind of comes up and maybe has like this little design like this or something, something, you know, something like that. Then I need to indicate it on the flap because this part of the print needs to be at the hem. So that will start to affect how I cut the fabric for this garment. So again, needs to be placed on the um, flat. Anything you would need to cut or make the garment needs to be on the flat. Um, in addition, let's say I have a, like a placement print. Now this could be um, something that the fabric is imprinted. It could be printed later, like a graphic tee say like a little logo or something and you have it you know here uh, and you want it to be here that needs to be placed on your flat because that is placement specific you know if you don't indicate it you just say they're going to put it wherever and it's not going to be good for you same thing with let's say you have a beading work and your beading work is um let's say you know just on your neckline and you're going to have it kind of dense around the neckline and then you're going to have it kind of fade out, you know, um, uh, less dense as it, it moves out from your neckline. This is important because we need to know how to place those beads. Um, we need to know that they're placed around the neckline and we need to know how they fade out when they stop, when they get less dense, um, things like that. So you always need to indicate those specific things uh, in your flats. Um, anything else I want to cover? I think that's about it. Always make your flats back and front view. Um, add additional drawings if needed. Uh, in, uh, additional notation if needed. Um, so on and so forth. Okay guys, uh, so this concludes our week on flats and hopefully um, you've learned more than you ever wanted to know about garment construction. Hopefully not too much more. Um, uh, and hopefully this will serve as a helpful guide to you moving forward in creating constructionally accurate flats, which is super important. Um, so I'll see you next week. And uh, again, the assignment uh, in tandem to this week is the flat assignment, which you can find in the assignment section in course section and course content on Blackboard. Uh, basically, just a quick rundown. It is to create your own flat. Um, uh, two garments, so that'll be a total of four sketches, so a back and front view for each garment, um, and you can do something that you design, or you can pick something out of your wardrobe or from online um, if you want a reference. Uh, sometimes it's good uh, to kind of warm up uh, by doing something that already exists so you can see all of the seaming and construction that is there, so you're not forgetting anything. Um, and of course these have to be done in Illustrator and um, just check the email uh, uh, where I linked how to create the desktop link between uh, your computers and the school computer so you can have access to Adobe. Uh, that link is also posted uh, in the course information, in course information section on Blackboard. Uh, so good luck with that. And again, if you do have issues with that, please open a help desk ticket with IT. Don't email me. I cannot help you. Uh, IT can help you. Um, other than that, signing off. Have a great weekend. And I can't wait to see your thoughts. All right. Bye-bye.